There are six questions that most people get wrong on the FAA's Part 107 Commercial Drone License Exam, and missing them could mean failing. So let's make sure that does not happen to you. Hey, I'm David Young from Drone Launch Academy, and we've helped tens of thousands of drone pilots pass their Part 107 exam. And today, I'm gonna walk you through six tricky Part 107 exam questions, along with giving you the answers and explanations so that you can pass your test with flying colors pun intended. All right, so let's get into it. Question number one. All right, let's talk about MSL versus AGL. These are two acronyms that you're going to need to know. Now, this question that we're about to do trips a lot of people up, but once you understand the difference between MSL and AGL, you'll be able to answer these types of questions very confidently. So the question we're looking at says, refer to FAA CT 8082H, basically the booklet that they want you to use during your test. So don't worry, they're going to give that booklet to you and I'll show it to you on screen here but you're gonna reference these figures from that book. So you're gonna look that up. So once we find that figure, the question goes on to say, find the radio tower that is directly to the south of Minot International Airport. So the tower is gonna to be along Interstate 83, and we're gonna see that it has a mean sea level altitude of 2,179 feet. And the question is gonna say, at what altitude above this obstruction is the unmanned aircraft operator allowed to fly? And so for our answer choices, we have a few options. Answer choice A is 700 feet mean sea level. Answer choice B is 2,579 feet above ground level. And then answer C is 798 feet above ground level. So first, let's talk about why this question often confuses people. There are three main reasons. First is that many test takers confuse MSL, which is mean sea level, with AGL above ground level. And let me talk about the difference between those two real quick. So MSL means sea level. Think of that as the altitude measured by the ocean's surface. So no matter where you are in the country, it's pretty much a universal reference point for all pilots and charts. And generally when people are talking about altitude, they're referring to mean sea level. Then we have AGL, which stands for above ground level. And that actually measures the height and distance directly from the ground beneath you to where you are flying or to where some object is located. All right, so the second reason that a question like this trips people up is that people don't correctly understand which type of airspace requires prior authorization before you fly. So in reality, you need prior permission to fly into any controlled airspace except for class E airspace that does not go to the surface surrounding an airport, which is designated on these charts by a dashed magenta line. And we can see that in this instance, the radio tower that we're talking about is within the shaded magenta line area, which means that class E airspace, class echo airspace, begins at 700 feet above ground level. And we're not inside of the dash magenta line area, meaning that the class E airspace begins at the surface. So in this instance that we're talking about, we do not need prior permission from the FAA to fly here. All right, and the third reason people get tripped up by this question is because they just don't read carefully. And I'll show you in just a minute how the FAA is gonna trick you on this question. For this question specifically, let's walk through the process of getting the correct answer. All right, so the chart shows us that the tower is 2,179 feet MSL, means sea level. And then we can see below that number will show us the AGL above ground level of 398 feet. Now we know the FAA rules say that drones are allowed to fly 400 feet above a structure. So to calculate how high we're allowed to fly, the max we're allowed to fly, let's look at those heights both in mean sea level and above ground level so we know what we're working with. So we're gonna add 400 feet to both of our numbers. So the height of the structure is 398 feet above ground level. We can add 400 to that, which means that we can fly 798 feet above ground level. And if we look at our MSL altitude, we're gonna take that 2,179 feet, add another 400 to get 2,579 feet MSL, mean sea level. All right, now let's take a look back at our answer choices that we had. Answer choice A was 700 feet mean sea level. Answer choice B was 2,579 feet above ground level. And answer choice C was 798 feet above ground level. Now, at quick glance, you might be tempted to choose option A if you're not remembering the airspace rules and where you're allowed to fly with or without FAA permission. We already talked about how this is a shaded magenta area, meaning that class E airspace begins at 700 feet above ground level, which does not require prior permission. So that's not gonna be a restriction for us. The question asked, how high can we fly? And we know from our earlier math that we're either looking for 798 feet above ground level or 2,579 feet mean sea level. So let's keep looking at our answers. So for answer choice B, we might be tempted to pick that one because whenever I do live study sessions of this stuff, people always jump to that answer quickly because if you look closely, it actually says 2,579 feet above ground level and not mean sea level. Is that not, that's not what we had. 
So this is a place where the FAA will try to trip you up by you not reading carefully. So we know it is not B. So now obviously all we're left with is answer choice C. And then we can see that this one is correct because it says 798 feet above ground level. Make sure you check the number and the type of altitude, all right? So now that we have that question, you've done one, let's go on to the next one. So question two, next up, we've got another confusing topic for most test takers, density altitude and what its effects are on your drone. So let's look at this question. What effect does density altitude have on the efficiency of a UA propeller? That just means unmanned aircraft propeller. So here are our options. A, propeller efficiency is increased. B, propeller efficiency is decreased. Or C, density altitude does not affect propeller efficiency. Now this question trips a lot of people up because they confuse air density with density altitude. Now, if you've been studying this, you gotta remember, high density altitude means thin air or air that does not have a lot of pressure. It's called high density altitude, not because you're physically up higher, but because the air behaves like you are at a higher altitude. Because at higher altitudes, the air is less dense. We're gonna get into why that has an impact in just a second. So propellers, including the ones on these drones, they function most efficiently in more dense air because there's more air molecules and the more air molecules you have packed in together, there's more for your drone's propeller to push against. So as air becomes less dense, which can be due to either higher physical altitude, a higher temperature or higher humidity, performance actually decreases. So think of the density altitude as the altitude that your drone feels like it is flying at. So a low density altitude could mean cool, dry, and highly pressurized air, which means there's lots of molecules for your props to push against, making them more efficient. So let's take what we've just learned and apply it to the question. So we know that at a high density altitude, the air is thinner. And then we know that thinner air equals decreased propeller efficiency. So the correct answer is B, propeller efficiency is decreased. And if you think you might have a difficult time uh, remembering this for the test, here's a little quick way to help you remember it. Think of H's. So high, hot, or humid air hurts performance, and the opposite will make performance better. So now that we've got question two answered and explained, let's move on to question number three. Question three is about visual line of sight and visual observers or VOs. Which of the following is true regarding the use of a visual observer or VO when flying under part 107? And here are our answer options. A, the use of a visual observer relieves the remote pilot command's requirement to maintain visual line of sight of the aircraft. B, a visual observer may only be used to enhance situational awareness, but the remote pilot in command must still be able to maintain line of sight during the operation. Or C, a visual observer may be positioned beyond the remote pilot in command's visual range to extend operational distance as long as the VO maintains visual line of sight with the drone. Those are wordy. All right. So these types of questions confuse people because they think sometimes that using a visual observer means that the pilot has no more responsibility to maintain your visual line of sight with the aircraft, which is just not true. Or some people assume that uh, FPV goggles or binoculars can sort of count as uh, having line of sight, but that is also not what the regulation says. So let's talk about what it actually says. Let's jump over to the exact place that the FAA talks about this, the regulation where we can find this information. So if we go to advisory circular or AC 107-2A, section 5.9, get nerdy with me, it talks about visual line of sight requirements and explains it a little bit. And it says that the drone must be seen with unaided vision. Corrective lenses like glasses are fine, but binoculars are not okay. Telescopes, obviously not okay. Uh, FPV goggles don't count either. All right, so here's the information about the role of the visual observer. The visual observer can supplement situational awareness when the remote pilot in command, the one who's actually in charge of the operation and operating the drone, uh, they may be momentarily busy, like checking the telemetry data on their controller or um, checking a chart, something like that. The visual observer helps ensure the drone's position, altitude, direction of flight, and awareness of hazards. But the remote pilot in command must still be able to maintain visual line of sight themselves. The visual observer does not replace uh, that responsibility for the pilot. So here's an example with FPV goggles. So if you're flying with goggles, you know, you have the goggles on, you're flying racing drones maybe. A visual observer has to be used if you want to meet that visual line of sight requirement. But technically that remote pilot in command is still required to be able to regain visual line of sight of the aircraft at any time. So they have to be able to take the goggles off and instantly see where that aircraft is. They can't fly it further than they can see it. So if we look back at our answer choices, the correct answer for this would be B. The visual observer can assist but it cannot replace the remote pilot command's requirement to maintain visual line of sight. So think of a visual observer as a backup for your eyes, not the only eyes, right? They're there to help, but the remote pilot command is still responsible 
for being able to look and see the aircraft at all time. Okay guys, we're halfway there, three questions down. If you're finding this helpful so far, go and hit that like button under the video, maybe hit subscribe if you wanna stay up to date with other things drone related. All right, let's look at question four now. Question four is about load factor, stall speed, and bank angle. Getting a little bit more manned aviation, fixed wing aircraft here. So the question says, how does increasing the bank angle in a turn affect stall speed? Now this is for, again, fixed wing aircraft. If you're flying multi-rotors, they don't have wings that are generating lift. That's all being done with the propellers. So for this, our options are, A, stall speed decreases as bank angle increases, B, stall speed increases as bank angle increases, or C, stall speed is unaffected by the bank angle. So these questions can be a little confusing because people often think stall speed, so the speed at which the wings no longer generate lift is sort of a fixed number for that airplane. But in reality, stall speed changes depending on the flight conditions, especially the bank angle and load factor. So on that part 107 test, you need to remember that tighter turns, so steeper bank angles, they increase the load on the aircraft, which will make it stall sooner, meaning that the stall speed is higher. So you, you're, as you're decreasing in speed, you're hitting that stall speed more quickly. So let's explain just a little bit more. A stall happens when a wing exceeds its critical angle of attack, which is when the airflow that's going over that wing sort of breaks down and the lift is lost. So in straight and level flight, lift is directed directly upwards opposite to gravity. So all that lift being generated is holding the aircraft in the air. But when you go into a banked turn, some of that lift is tilted, so to speak. So some of it is being generated to the side to kind of cause the aircraft to turn. And then the rest of that lift is going upwards, keeping that aircraft in the air. But to stay level and not let the nose dip down, the aircraft must generate more total lifts to compensate for that. So to do that, pilots of fixed wing aircraft typically will sort of pull back on their controls, causing the nose of the aircraft to pitch upward, which causes a tighter turn. And all this extra demand increases the load on the wings. So at a 60 degree bank, for example, the load factor on the aircraft doubles to twice uh, the normal force of gravity, or as you would call it, two Gs. And because the wing has to work harder and has this extra load, the speed at which the aircraft stalls increases. So for example, uh, an aircraft with a normal stall speed of let's say 50 knots may stall closer to 70 knots if it's doing a steep 60 degree turn. So let's look back at our question. Increasing the bank angle actually increases the stall speed because of a higher load factor. So the correct answer would be B. Stall speed increases as bank angle increases. So think of it this way, another uh, device to help you remember, steeper equals sooner, so S and S. The steeper you bank, the sooner you're gonna hit that stall speed because your wings are working overtime both to hold the turn uh, and to keep the nose of the aircraft up. All right, on to question five. This question is about impairment when you're operating your drone. It asks, which of the following is not prohibited when operating a small UAS under Part 107 regulations? Your options are A, operating a small UAS after taking a prescription medication that does not impair your judgment. B, operating a small UAS with a blood alcohol concentration or BAC of 0.04% or greater. Or C, operating a small UAS within eight hours of consuming alcohol. Now, some people get tripped up on the wording here. This is because it's a double negative type of question that the FAA is gonna try to trick you with. The question asks, which of these is not prohibited? So that means that we need to choose the answer that is allowed, if that makes sense. So if we're gonna look at our answer choices and remember what the part 107 regulations are, we know that B and C are clear violations. You know you cannot operate your drone if your blood alcohol concentration is greater than or equal to 0.04%. You also can definitely not operate your drone less than eight hours after drinking alcohol. I know that option A might sound kind of scary, right? Operating a small unmanned aircraft after taking prescription medication, but the key phrase here is that it does not impair your judgment. So if you're taking prescription medication that doesn't impair your judgment, then you would be allowed to operate that drone after taking it, right? So the correct answer would be A. You just gotta be careful about those double negative questions. Watch carefully for language like not prohibited or not required. Reread that question and kind of flip it in your head to think what is allowed. That will help you from falling into that double negative trap. All right, are you ready for the last and final question? Question six is about airspace authorization. So which types of airspace require authorization before flying under part 107? So here we've got several options. Uh, option A is class Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and surface level class E or class Echo airspace. Answer choice B is class Bravo, Charlie, and Delta only. Answer choice C is class Echo above 700 feet and 
class G, class golf. So these types of questions can trip people up because they often assume that all of class E airspace, since it is controlled airspace that requires authorization. But they forget that surface level E is treated differently than class E airspace that begins at 700 feet above ground level or 1200 feet above ground level. The FAA test questions sometimes phrase this in confusing ways, which leads people to overthink it. So let's talk through it, right? These are the various controlled airspaces that require airspace authorization. So class Bravo, I think B for big, if you've ever studied this stuff, you'll, you'll know Bravo is B, B for big. Big airports, Atlanta, Miami, New York, those types of airports. Air spirits authorization before you enter them is obviously always required. Class C, your class Charlie airspace, a little bit smaller airports you're gonna find still have approaches and they have towers, so you need airspace authorization before going into those as well. Class of Delta airspace, a bit smaller, but still have active control towers with air traffic and you do need permission before going there. And class E is a little different. These are non-towered airports that are typically less busy, but still technically are controlled airspace. So there is airspace that do not require authorization are the class E airspace that begins at 700 feet above ground level or, or higher. So that's typically shown by the shaded magenta line. You don't need any permission to fly there. Also class G, class golf is uncontrolled. If you've ever studied this stuff before, you might have remembered a device of class golf G. G means go, you don't need any authorization beforehand, okay? So the correct answer to this question is gonna be answer choice A, which is class Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and surface level class E only. All right, we did it. Now you know how to confidently answer six tricky questions on the part 107 exam, which means that you are one step closer to acing your test and getting your remote pilot certificate. Now, I have one thing for you. If you're serious about passing your part 107 exam, I've got something that might help you. At our company, Drill Launch Academy, we've put together a very comprehensive part 107 prep course that gives you everything that you need to succeed on this test. So inside you're gonna get clear, easy to follow video lessons, hundreds and hundreds of practice questions, a full length practice exam simulations, and we even have a seven day study guide that walk you through what to study each day step by step. We've already helped over 30,000 students pass on their very first try. We even back it up with a pass guarantee that if you go through the course, you pass our final exam, and then you happen to fail your real FAA test, we will give you all of your money back that you paid us, plus we'll send you a check for 175 bucks to cover your testing center fee. Uh, you also get lifetime access to any and all updates, so you're always studying the latest material. And since you're watching this video, you get 50 bucks off. So just check out the link in the description below. All the details will be down there. And if that's something that you wanna do, you can jump on that. Otherwise, I'm glad you're here enjoying this video, learning a little bit. If you have any questions about part 107 stuff, just leave it in the comments below. We'd love to help you out and chat about it. Thanks for being here. Happy flying and good luck on your test.